Good morning from Melbourne and hello to those logging in from around the world. Welcome to today's Asia Society Briefing on the Chinese Communist Party at 100. James Scullin here, Director of Programs at Asia Society Australia. As is the custom in Australia, Asia Society acknowledges that many participants in today's event are dialing in from locations that have traditional owners and custodians. Today I'm speaking to you from the Bun Ruwung and Wurundjeri lands of the East Kulin Nation, and I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. As I'm sure all attendees are well aware, this July the CCP has been celebrating its centenary in grand style in Beijing and across China. The party has certainly come a long way since a meeting of covert revolutionaries in 1921 to one of the world's largest and most influential modern day political parties that boasts a membership of in excess of 95 million and permeates much of contemporary Chinese life. While there's been no shortage of commentary on the milestones and key events of the Chinese Communist Party's last 100 years, on this session we're looking to demystify the operational side of the party. To help us do that today, we've assembled a stellar panel who will dive into the party's mechanics, looking at the processes, benefits and incentives to party membership. Before we get into today's discussion, to, to, to today's discussion, let me go through some brief housekeeping. We'll begin with a moderated 35 minute panel discussion and then move on to Q&A. If attendees have any questions throughout the session, please type them into the Q&A box below. Unfortunately, due to the number of participants on today's call, uh, we won't be able to call on attendees individually. So please enter your questions in the Q&A box. It's now my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. A former professor of mine, Dr. Pradeep Tanija, is a senior lecturer in Chinese politics, political economy and international relations at the University of Melbourne. Pradeep was a graduate student at Peking University in the 1980s and has worked in various parts of China for a number of years. He's currently working on a project examining the relationship between China's business elite and the Communist Party of China. Ning Lin is an assistant professor at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University in Washington. Ning's research examines how non-democratic institutions create unintended consequences in state business relations and development outcomes. Her area of focus is China. Eric Bagshaw is a North Asia correspondent for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. He was the Wallace Brown Young Press Gallery Journalist of the Year in 2019 and has won a number of Walkley Awards. Eric recently wrote a significant piece on the operations of the CCP and is joining us today from Tokyo, where he's generously taking time out from reporting on the Tokyo Olympics. Finally, our moderator today is Asia Society Australia's inaugural scholar in residence, Dr. Bates Gill. Bates is head of the Department of Security Studies and Criminology at Macquarie University and has a 30 year career as a scholar, policy advisor and author focusing on Asia, Poli Asia Pacific politics, foreign policy and security with a particular focus on China and US China relations. His current research focuses on Xi diplomacy, China's more dynamic and risk taking foreign policy under Xi Jinping, which will appear as a major publication with Oxford University Press in 2022. For a full view of the expertise of our speakers, please be sure to click on the link we're sharing with you now to read their full bios. Thank you to all of the panelists for joining today's session. It's great to have you with us. And Bates, it's now over to you. Thank you very much, James. And thanks to the entire Asia Society Australia team for pulling together this great discussion. And thanks to all of you tuning in from around the world. We're looking forward to a great conversation. Uh, as James has already noted, uh, we have all been following closely the remarkable set of celebrations and commemorations as the Chinese Communist Party celebrates its 100th birthday. Um, we've also been watching so carefully because we recognize that particularly under Xi Jinping over the past, say, eight years, um, the party itself has become such a more significant aspect of daily life, uh, just uh, among uh, Chinese citizens, uh, as well as a, a sort of more robust effort under Xi to inject a greater degree of party uh, loyalty, uh, ideology, uh, emphasis on legitimacy of the party, uh, not only within domestic policy, but also importantly, across China's foreign policy as matters of legitimacy, even indeed the uh, superiority 
of Chinese, I should say socialism with Chinese characteristics is increasingly touted and promoted uh, through uh, China's international relationships. But as James said, as important as all those issues are, left unsaid or under-examined are the mechanics, the practicalities of party membership itself and the particular roles it plays within society uh, and even intra-party relationships that are so important to understanding the mechanisms of this, of this organization and how it plays out then more broadly domestically and internationally. And we have this great group of people with us today to talk about these, uh, let's call it inside understandings of how the party works. So I'm looking forward to the conversation with everyone. What we'll, what we'll do is uh, just take about 30 minutes or so here to hear from our assembled panel experts. And then we're looking forward to opening this up to questions and discussions following that. Let me turn my first question, if I may, uh, to Professor Tanija Pradeep. Um, I'm really interested to hear your views because I know you've been following this very, very closely. Um, is there any way to compare this uh, 100th anniversary with other milestones uh, over the course of the past 100 years for the party? And in particular, what, what came out for you in following the celebrations this time around in terms of how it was done in different parts of the country? Anything that you would take away particularly about the celebrations over the past month? Thanks, Bates. Uh, you know, I started looking early this year as the celebrations of the centenary of the CCP were ramping up. I thought I should go back and look at the 50th anniversary celebrations in 1971. And that really sets up a good contrast between China 50 years ago and China today, almost like bookends. Uh, in 1971, of course, there were celebrations to mark the 50th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. But these celebrations weren't as grand or as glitzy, but there was a great deal of propaganda even at that time. And, and if you look through some of the publications that were being put out by the Red Flag magazine or the People's Daily, there was much greater emphasis on ideology. There was much greater emphasis on on ideological struggles within the Chinese Communist Party, the so-called left and the so-called right, and still the criticism of people like Chen Doshu and others. But at the same time, China also was insecure. China was very insecure because remember, only days after the 50th anniversary celebrations in Beijing, uh, Kissinger was to arrive in, in, in China. And, and of, obviously those negotiations have been going on you know, since September, 1970. And that was an indication of a very insecure China, even though it continued to condemn imperialism, but at the same time, it was about to sit down and talk to Kissinger, talk to the Australians, because Gough Whitlam was also uh, in China only days, in fact, two or three days after the 50th anniversary celebrations in Beijing. So that was a China which was ideologically really very conflicted at the time, and at the same time insecure because they were worried about the Soviet Union and they were gonna sit down with Kissinger to talk about how they could work with the West. Today, China is in a very different position. If you look at the celebrations this year, the celebrations for the centenary have been, as I said, very glitzy. Uh, and, and these celebrations have been done in a very professional, very systematic way, even though the celebrations on the 1st of July in Tiananmen Square look more like Pyongyang than Beijing, but, but certainly there's been a great deal of you know, professionalism demonstrated in these celebrations. But at the same time, if you look at Xi Jinping's speech in, in Tiananmen Square, that speech is it conveys a very different message to the messages you know, in, you know, 50 years ago. Now this is about a strong China, a confident China, uh, even though there may be insecurity, but that insecurity is very much sort of hidden. And the focus is that China will not accept bullying by foreign countries. China will meet force with force. And therefore the message that is being conveyed to the Chinese people and to the rest of the world is that this is a very confident China. It is a China whose time has come and China that is willing to take on the world. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pradeep. That really does set the scene for us and, and I think very accurately reflects the very different kind of China 50 years since 1971 that we are now uh, uh, working with, dealing with. Let me ask Eric, you know, Eric, you followed uh, the party quite closely as well. And um, with 92 million members now, uh, it's obviously a diverse organization in many respects, uh, even as it represents a, a tiny proportion, tiny proportion of the overall uh, Chinese population. It would be interesting to hear from you. I mean, is it representative in any other ways other than its claimed mandate to lead uh, the, the, the People's Republic of China? Um, is it representative as to gender or you know, age distribution, income, status, other factors? Um, in what ways does the party represent the larger population uh, in those terms? And, and have the demographics changed over the past 100 years? Yeah, thanks, Bates. Look, the party has changed as China has changed. <clears throat> um, fundamentally, it started with, you know, 53 of the, the first members, uh, you know, uh, way back at the beginning of the, the 20th century, and it now numbers 92 million. So when you've got that kind of explosion in numbers, you're going to get an extraordinary diversity of membership. But as China has grown wealthier, uh, so has the CP CCP's members. That means that the party of the farmers, the party of the workers, has increasingly become the party of the university educated. Uh, in 2012 or so, we, we sort of saw the most definitive shift where the majority of members for the first time had now had a university degree. And that trend has continued to the point where now about 35% or so of members are workers or farmers uh, and the rest have tertiary educations. And that's because fundamentally the party is a, is a vehicle for upward social mobility as much as it is uh, for you know, ideology and, um, and pragmatic purposes. So it's, you know, in a way, 92 million members, it's you know, 6% or so of the Chinese population, which is still a huge amount of people to be a member of a political party. You would compare it with Australia or the United States, it'd be a fraction of that in, as a proportion of the population that would be members of the political party. But inherently, if you're joining the party, you're joining it, you know, both perhaps because you believe in it, but also to serve your own interests. And so you have upwardly mobile people, most of the men, who may want to join things like the civil service when more than 90 percent of uh of members are, are party members uh, and likewise uh, at the very top of universities in china uh you know those same demographic um, structures uh, where older men dominate uh in australia or the united states japan are also in place in china and so is that representative of um of China? No, but I guess is any one country representative uh, at a leadership level is the question. Which means that you still have a party, um, you know, increasingly that is less focused on the day to day ideology and more about how it can control within private structures that are starting that it's starting to flourish in. And a key statistic, you know, it wasn't really until 2001 that business people were allowed to join the party, for example. Today, 73% of Chinese companies have a party cell installed. So as China has increasingly uh, moved into the, into the private sector, into maximizing its market capitalization, so has the party. And that means that we now have a, a party members that work right across uh, China's booming uh, private sector. Okay, thanks, Eric. You know, that leads us really to the, to the next set of issues. I'm hoping that to Professor Lung, uh, Ning uh, could address, you know, um, you know, taking up where Eric sort of left off there, what are the benefits then? I mean, how do individuals in China view the benefits of party membership to one's social life, to one's professional life, for example? Uh, is it the case that people would tend to keep their membership sort of private? Or is it something that you'd wear, in a sense, uh, sort of, um, you know, as representative of a kind of social status that one has attained within society. Is, is it enviable, for example? Is, is it, is it, is it a, an attractive thing, obviously, to, to become a party member? Absolutely. 
So um, research actually could tell us one thing or two about the benefits of being a CCP party member. So we know several things. This is based on empirical studies. First, Communist Party members, they do receive a wage premium in the labor markets relative to non-party members. They are paid better, they are paid higher. And also, this is particularly true in urban China, where you will see the difference in wage between party members and non-party members to be the highest. This is also true for um, people working in state-owned enterprises and um, government-related entities, where being a party member really pushes you to higher paid positions. This is also true for female. If you are a party member and you are female, you'll be paid way much better than a female that is not party member. So we know this part. And this is closely related to the second finding that we know from the literature, that it's much easier for CCP members to get certain type of jobs. So government related jobs, civil servants, as Eric was mentioning, stay owned enterprises, banks, universities, anything that is related to government, being a party member helps you with employment opportunities. So the third one we know is that being a party member helps in promotion. So again, clearly in all of these government and government related entities, you are going to be promoted to a higher position if you are a party member compared to those who are not. So these are the basic um, knowledge we know from empiric findings. One very interesting finding I thought from um, 2008 from two economists, Simon Appleton and Lina Sung, is that CCP members also have a higher life satisfaction. So this is compared to the mass public. They're happier with everything their income, their job security, their social welfare, their marriage even, and their children. And the interesting thing is there are also eight other minor political parties in China. They do not feel a higher life satisfaction compared to the mass public, only CCP members do. So this says a lot about party membership, um, what it brings. Now is party membership, um, do people keep it as a secret or do people flaunt it? My there is no data supporting this because surveys on or public opinion on this kind of issues will not be allowed. My personal observation is neither. So people neither talk about it in daily life. Like I think about my friends in China, I don't know who is a party member or not. But I do think and I believe that in a workplace, particularly where a workplace with a lot of party members, everybody will know who is or is not a party member. So it's not a secret um, or something to flaunt. Do people envy party members? I don't know either. I think party member is definitely, as we mentioned, the benefits and how Eric mentioned it's so difficult to become a party member. It shows that people would like to become party member to advance in the society. But those people who did not choose to become a party member, I don't know if they envy it. Maybe they just have a different career in mind. So hard to answer empirically. Well, it sounds as if there are some pretty significant benefits, not just sort of remuneration. Uh, but even uh, satisfaction with life. And so you'd, you'd think that um, um, it would be a rather competitive process uh, in order to become a party member, you know, not to mention the relative exclusivity of the fact that only about six or 7% of the entire population are party members. So, so Eric, um, what, what, what is the process then? I mean, how does one become a member? How do you, how, what makes you successful uh, in becoming uh, a party member? Um, and then, you know, once you are in, how do you stay in? What's expected of you? You know, how do you move up in the system? What, what, what do you need to do to uh, be a good party member and continue to reap those benefits? So I think the best comparison we can draw here is again with the US or Australia, where if you were to join the Democrats or the Republicans, you might go to a, uh, a, a local branch meeting, uh, sign a form, maybe pay maybe pay a little um, donation and all of a sudden you're you're a liberal party member or a democrat or a republican you know they're, they're, it's in their interest to try and get as many people as possible uh signing onto the books that is not the case in china where uh ccp membership um really is a a, a grueling process um you know at the first stage someone interested in becoming a member they run background checks on to verify that they're ideologically pure uh, they have to uh, basically apply by um, by demonstrating how their skills and how their values will serve the party. Uh, once they get through through that stage, uh, the the candidates are vetted, uh, and they have to go through a, a year long uh, training process. And that this this covers the three main schools of thought, uh, from 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 Mao to Deng to to now. Xi Jinping thought and socialism with Chinese characteristics. So you have these three key stages in terms of development of CCP thought. 
uh, then they have to uh, demonstrate again um, that they're committed to the party by going to, um, to study sessions, by reading party journals, uh, by participating in party meetings. Um, and then finally, they, they are, you know, if they are approved, um, you know, you then have to regularly, for example, if you are a member of uh, the party cell in your workplace, you know, you might have um, weekly uh, meetings uh, where you might discuss uh, how, the, how the workplace is conforming to party ideology, or you might discuss broader socialism with Chinese characteristics, and you'd be expected to attend those. Now, imagine for some people in Shanghai that really uh, they're having a chat, uh, you know, sort of uh, dis discussing socialism with Chinese characteristics before they're knocking off for a few beers. But for others, you're probably in a situation where you do have more zealous instruction, uh, and particularly, obviously, in the civil service, um, that, that you need to maintain your ideological purity uh, in order to continue to rise and to grow within the party. So the political experience in China uh, could not be more different from what we have in the West. Well, that's right. Um, and I was thinking uh, the most famous, maybe the most famous example of gaining party membership that we know of, at least is the uh, story told uh, of Xi Jinping's attempt uh, to become a party member back in the 19, the late 1960s and early 1970s, in which apparently his application was knocked back numerous times, uh, probably because of um, his own father's falling out with Mao Zedong uh, in the early 1960s. Um, but it, it was a grueling process, apparently, even for someone who would ultimately become the general secretary um, of the party. Um, Ning, um, maybe you could follow up on this quickly, and then we'll open it back up with Pradeep to talk on some other issues before we wrap up. Um, you know, once you're in the party then, and you have expectations to rise to much higher levels, you know, maybe you're going to move up within the party itself, or you might move up through the ranks of these various institutions uh, that they're in, whether it's banks, state-owned enterprises, civil service, all of these sorts of things. Um, what specifically are you aware of that, you know, um, are looked at? What, what's examined specifically? Is it a, is it a meritocratic process? Uh, does it also have a lot to do with ideology? Um, what are the incentives then that are applied uh, for the promotion of, of party members as cadres? Mm -hmm. So we know from the formal party constitution and formal documents that every party cadre is subject to three sets of evaluation criteria. The first two sets of the criteria are subjective. One is a top-down evaluation by the CCP standing committee at the upper level government, so your boss. The second set of subject evaluation is done by your subordinate. So this is a bottom-up evaluation. It should be anonymous by your colleagues and the officials under you to rate whether you are satisfactory leaders. These two sets of subjective evaluation criteria, we know very little about it. Not just we as a scholar consider that as a black box, local officials themselves consider particularly the top-down evaluation as a black box. They do not know exactly how to make their boss, so to speak, like them, and whether they are performing well in the boss's eyes. So they, are, they feel highly insecure about the top-down evaluation. The bottom-up evaluation, the subjective part, we know a tiny bit from it. And interestingly, one of the um, clue we have is from this documentary by Zhou Hao called the party secretary. In this documentary, he was following a county-level party secretary who is about to be promoted. And there was a scene at um, a dining, you know, a banquet, where this party secretary was negotiating with his subordinates about what kind of evaluation score he's hoping for. So only through this kind of anecdotal evidence do we know these processes are pro probably like highly uncontrolled by the local officials themselves. They probably feel insecure about it. We suspect as scholars, maybe faction plays a role in it, maybe loyalty plays a role in it. We do not know what determines the subjective evaluation scores. We know much more about the third set of evaluation scores, and this is heavily studied in the literature. It is the quantitative evaluation um, criteria, which is, should be based on meritocracy. It's called the cadre evaluation um, TRS, target-based responsibility system evaluation. So basically, this is um, annual quantitative list of policy targets assigned to all the party cadres actually end a few non-party cadres at the top of each level of government. 
what it does is basically the central government makes a short list and say, here are the priorities of policies that you have to meet next year. They have economic growth in them, environmental protection, um, environment preservation, social welfare, et cetera, et cetera, about 20 something categories. Provincial governments then receive this list from the central government. They think about, okay, what is the comparative advantage of the province and what is our focus? And then based on the central government list, they make a longer list at the provincial level. Again, a list of quantitative um, policy targets that the local officials have to meet. So you have this increasingly more specific um, quantitative policy list of targets, level, every level down to the next level of party cadres. And they have to fulfill these policies at the end of the year, they come back and fill in a form and say, here is my achievement. And based on how well you achieve these um, policy targets, you're going to get a score. The higher the score, the more bonus you will get at the end of the year, and the more likely you will promote it at the end of your tenure. So we know um, something about this system. What matters the most in the system? So um, very briefly, before 2013, we say economic growth was in consensus. That is the most important target. Officials who did really well in promoting growth will be promoted. Even though today it became debatable. Some scholars said, but once you control for factional ties, you notice that um, performance doesn't matter that much. Nowadays, we notice that um, other targets on this list become very important, such as one veto target, where these are policies that has a red line that no official can um, tread. For example, one child policy, you have to reach a hard criteria. For example, 99% of the birth is you know, the first child, only child. That kind of one veto policies are very important for one's promotion. So we know something about it and we believe that this is indeed a meritocracy based even though there's also gaming in the system. But in general, these are the three sets of evaluation for each party official in China. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Ning. That's really very helpful. I mean, it does sound like a, a mix, like it is in many parts of the world, of both subjective and um, um, purportedly objective, um, you know, factors. But it it sounds again quite quite rigorous uh, in the way that it's applied. Pretty. Um, in the remaining time we have, we've got about uh, you know eight to ten minutes, perhaps, before we want to turn it open to our audience. Um, I'm wondering if you could tackle two issues I know you're trying to follow very closely. Um, one has to do sort of with the nature of the party. I mean, I think it's still accurate to consider the Communist Party of China as a Leninist style party, um, you know, very much in its organizational structure, similar to others uh, of a Leninist nature, like the former Communist Party of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, in North Korea, uh, elsewhere. Um, but we know that there are also distinctive features. And I, I'd, be, I'd be interested to hear your thinking about what distinguishes the Chinese Communist Party from others uh, 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 in the world um, in terms of its structure and its nature. And maybe one of those issues, and this is the second part I'd be interested uh, in hearing, is how the party relates to businesses, how the party relates to the private sector. Um, so anything you'd like to say about uh, the, distinct, the distinctiveness of the party as a communist party, and in particular, uh, how the party is dealing today and likely in the future with its burgeoning private sector. Thanks, Bates. Uh, the first part about, you know, the, the Leninist nature of the Chinese Communist Party, and it is true, I think it's, it comes out in many studies that although China has been implementing economic reforms and reforms to institutions for the last 40 plus years. But the party remains very much organized along the Leninist line. So the, the, the key principles of Leninism, for example, democratic centralism, which has been a key feature of you know, the Chinese Communist Party, and as it was of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, has been that the people like the, the rank and file members of the Chinese Communist Party are involved in the decision-making process in the sense that uh, decisions are initially made at the top and then they are transmitted down to the branches at different levels. Eric mentioned the party meetings. Uh, and I remember living in China in the eighties and nineties when you go to an office uh, and particularly you know, where you have a party meeting and usually it used to be, I think on Wednesdays, Wednesday afternoon, all the party members used to 
to get together and and often half of them would be sleeping because they would be going through documents which were being read they were asked to read these documents discuss and eventually endorse these documents so the the decisions were made at the top but they were communicated down to the rank and file members of the chinese communist party to endorse nothing would change nothing would change but it would create an impression that everybody's involved in that process and the process of these meetings was in fact to get greater buy-in by these rank and file members to support the party policies and that hasn't changed uh, i don't think the interest of the party members uh, the average party member in in these meetings has has improved i think most party members still are bored at these meetings but the whole principle is that we try and control as much you can so i think the party operates on the principle and particularly under xi jinping is that the things that you control are safe and things that you don't control are too dangerous too risky and that's why i think xi jinping ever since he came to power in 2012 as the party general secretary, he has tried to control as many aspects of the governance of China as he possibly can. So there is that continuity in the sense that there is a desire, there's this urge to try and control as many things as you can. And in fact, during Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao's time, there was a much more relaxed, I think, attitude that party members had, and, and that seems to have you know, shifted. That brings me to the second question, which is really interesting about the relationship between the party and business or the government and business. Remember in 2001, when Jiang Zemin changed the party constitution under his so-called policy of three represents, and he argued that the businessmen, the private sector businessmen, the entrepreneurs, that they represent a, a advanced productive force. And this advanced productive force is also part of the ruling classes, and therefore they should also be involved in, in the functioning of the party. And in 2001, he opened up the party to the membership of the, you know, the business community. Now, many of these uh, entrepreneurs were already party members because they were party members before they became entrepreneurs. You know, initially the policy was that you allow the entrepreneurs to you allow party officials, the cadres, to engage in a bit of business. So they could they could dip their toes in the sea, you know, shah, eh? that the phrase which was very popular in the 1990s, that they could they could experiment and they they were even given leave from their party and government jobs to start a business. And the idea was that you go and start a business. If the business succeeds, you can continue doing business and we'll be happy with that. But if the business doesn't work, you can always come back to your official position. And therefore, in 2001, when Chiang Zemin brought in this new policy, which allowed new members, people who were not members of the Chinese Communist Party, when they became entrepreneurs, when they became successful entrepreneurs, Chiang Zemin opened the door for these people to become party members. And now there were certain benefits, of course, of becoming a party member. So, for example, many of the most successful the richer entrepreneurs who joined the Chinese Communist Party, their primary interest was to be able to get access to information by being a party member, by networking, by attending refresher courses in the Central Party School in Beijing, or in the Putong Academy in Shanghai, or even in other party schools, they would be able to get closer to you know, party officials who are really responsible for making important policy decisions. And their interest was that by, by being part of this network, they will benefit. As far as the party was concerned, I think Chiang Zemin and the party's thinking at the time in 2001 was that these people, as they accumulate wealth, they will become influential. And as they become influential, and money, of course, as we know, money buys power in many parts of the world. And Chiang Zemin was afraid that by leaving them outside the tent, they could become a threat they could become you know, a danger to the party. And therefore he changed the party constitution to bring them, to co-opt them into the party. And that continued until Xi Jinping. And the party, the entrepreneurs who joined the party beginning in 2001, and those who were already party members before 2001, I think until Xi Jinping came to power 
in 2012, these people were happy to work with the party. They were allowed to make money. Many of them became incredibly wealthy. But since Xi Jinping's crackdown on corruption, I think many of these party members are now very worried about their continuing success as entrepreneurs. And we've seen recently the troubles that Jack Ma, this you know, the famous Jack Ma of Alibaba, or you know, this company Titi have had recently, that indicates that the party is now sure about the loyalty and the trustworthiness of these entrepreneurs. So we are really entering uncharted waters now because we do have people who are very wealthy, Many of them have incredible wealth. And at the same time, they are being marginalized within the party and within, you know, by the government. And we don't know what that would lead to. But that, I think, is a risk that Xi Jinping seems to be prepared to take. Thanks very much, Pradeep. I think that's very insightful. And I think the key word there is co-opting. Uh, clearly, that was the intent of Jiang Zemin uh, in, in, in opening up the party to membership by these sorts of individuals uh, and the struggle we now see unfolding with the likes of Jack Ma and others uh, is clearly around the question of um, willingness to be co-opted uh, and willingness to share the uh, enormous reservoirs of information, data, uh, insight into Chinese society that these entrepreneurs companies possess uh, and, uh, and the a desire of the party to have access to it uh, more more readily uh, really calls into question the co-option strategy. So this has been great conversation, everyone. We've already got a list of some excellent uh, issues and questions we want to try and get to. So let's take, say, the next, uh, well, we have a little bit less than 20 minutes now before we do our wrap up. But I'm just going to pose one question for you all to be thinking about, and we'll try to get to it at the very end for you three. Um, and that's on the issue of succession and the future of the party, succession to Xi Jinping. And, you know, are we gonna be having this conversation uh, at the next major milestone uh, uh, for the party? And that is the 100th anniversary of the country itself, the People's Republic in 2049. What's the future gonna look like for a party which appears to have been up to this point highly successful. But let's get back to some of the mechanics here. Um, one of the questions that I think was quite interesting raised here um, has to do with the party and the people. Uh, we, we see in many parts of the world, especially in the liberal democratic West, an effort by some to differentiate, uh, to suggest uh, that the party and the people are actually two different things. Uh, and that while we might uh, uh, you know, dislike or, or uh, uh, not appreciate aspects of the party and the way it governs and how it treats uh, the Chinese people in some instances, um, it's the Chinese people who we should be uh, more supportive of. Is that, is that a logical way of looking at the relationship between the party and the people? Um, uh, Ning, is there any good data out there uh, that we can consider reliable about what what is the status of the party within the larger population? Is it, is it, is it a favorable view? Should we, should we try to pretend to separate the party from the people? So unfortunately, there is no data about this because, again, public opinion or surveys on this very topic is simply not allowed um, in China. We do have other surveys that could proxy this question um, before 2000 and I don't remember, 14, 15, before they were also banned. And these were surveys about Chinese people's view and trust in the government. So the interesting um, takeaway from these surveys is we could see that Chinese people are less, and actually way less, um, confident or say favorable to their local governments. However, as the government level goes up, there is a really dominant favorable view of the Chinese central government. Now, whether the party and the people are the same thing or are they opposed, we don't know. But we could safely assume that Chinese people would say the party and the central government, the highest level of authority, will be the same thing. So I think those surveys that says, you know, more than 95% favorable view in the central government says something about Chinese people's view of the party. Just a quick follow up on that, Ning, um, having to do with what we talked about earlier in terms of promotion, uh, and how one advances. One thing we haven't really touched on is whether or not corruption is an aspect 
of promotion, um, one of those subjective factors, if you will, uh, for promotion. And, 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 and that may well affect then how um, people, everyday people view uh, party members, especially at loca local levels. Uh, the degree to which corruption may still be an aspect here, um, not only affecting promotion, but then affecting day-to-day -day lives of individuals who are trying to get by. Um, what do we know about that in terms of uh, its effect on promotion and its effect on people's views? So on the first question, we don't have systematic data because again, corruption is such a hard to measure um, issue. However, we do know that when somebody is accused and convicted of corruption, either within the party or at the state. Basically, the political career is largely over. They might not be kicked out of the cadre team, but the opportunity of promotion will really drop once you are um, accused and convicted. As for people, we have really conflicting findings so far in the empirical literature. Some literature would find that, you know, these are all like local regional surveys, that um, anti-corruption increased people's trust, again, in the central government, but we also have um, recent surveys um, online that shows netizens actually find the anti-corruption reviewed such deep level of corruption that it dropped their trust in the government. So it's still, we don't know enough about the second question yet. Thanks, Ning, and apologies to everyone. There's some noise outside of my house here. You might be able to hear. Um, Eric, a quick question we have from one of our uh, chat uh, questions has to do with future demographics of the party. Uh, can you? Can you suggest anything uh, as to what we might uh, be able to speculate as to future ethnic composition in the party, uh, especially given the, you know, the very difficult situation now uh, between um, the central government and, and ethnic parts of China as in Tibet or in Xinjiang? And what about the demographic uh, shift that's occurring in China as it becomes a much older country in terms of average age, and uh, and the youth population is, is shrinking relative to the elderly. Are these elements, ethnic and demographic, going to have some kind of impact on party composition going forward? Well, the CCP faces a, a really massive challenge uh, because fundamentally, uh, there's not enough kids being born in China uh, to sustain its current levels of, of economic growth. Um, you know, the one-child policy uh, had its intended effect, but perhaps too much of its intended effect. Uh, and so now you have a, a, a party, um, which is, of course, made up of, of all, all of the demographics of, of China uh, that is struggling to, um, uh, to also turn, turn around its own ageing process. Um, you know, there's, it's, let's, let's, have, let's have a look even at, at the, the Politburo and all the lead, senior leadership of the party. Uh, now that Xi Jinping has eliminated term limits, um, you know, he could be well into his 80s um, by the time he either resigns or, or, or perhaps even dies in office. And I think that's symbolic of the broader challenge of the party in that it does not have a young, enough young people coming through simply because there aren't enough in China. So it's going to have to um, really drive uh, that recruitment drive. Uh, through the younger levels of society. And perhaps, you know, you could see uh, if it wants to maintain the breadth um, and depth of numbers that it has had, loosening some of the application requirements at the same time as it, you know, tightens for higher levels of, um, of leadership within the party, you know, that it, it may need to become more of a kind of a, a, a less exclusive, more populist club um, if it's going to continue to maintain the numbers that it does have. Um, on the question of ethnic minorities, well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a devilishly complicated one because, once again, um, you do have members in, in, say, Xinjiang or Tibet or Hong Kong who uh, see an advantage out of joining the party. But then those same members may well be ostracised by their own ethnicities because they've joined the party. So you end up with a fork in the road. Uh, for people who have, um, in many ways, been subjugated by the CCP, um, and those that may want to join, you know, I guess the um, the mainland um, or, or, or rather the the broader party structure, risk being ostracised 
by the ethnicities they're meant to represent. So that is going to become a real challenge. It depends in many ways on how successfully the CCP uh, can assimilate and make uniform a single Chinese identity. Uh, and that is, of course, the great challenge it's going to have on the next over the next few decades. And thanks very much for that, Eric. It would be interesting to know the data. I myself do not. Uh, you know, ethnic, ethnicities in China, at least as officially defined by the government, represent only about uh, what seven or eight percent of the total population of the country. The remainder being of the Han ethnicity. So dominant. You know, overwhelmingly dominant. Uh, even though you know traditional ethnic lands make up some 50 percent of the Chinese territory, um, which is interesting to think about. Um, I would suspect that within the party itself, uh, that percentage is either the same or lower um, as a representation of ethnic minorities in the party. But I, but I'm not sure. It'd be interesting to try to find out. Now, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left before we're going to turn it back over to James, maybe even a little bit less. I wanted to get Pradeep in on this conversation, Pradeep. Some of the questions coming through are quite interesting and, and get us back a little bit to this issue of the image of the party, you know, the Leninist nature of the party. Um, and I'd be interested to hear your views on this, Pradeep. To what extent do you think that the, the nature of the governing system in China, that is, you know, an unelected, self-appointed uh, Leninist party claiming a mandate of power, uh, clearly backed up by its performance, but also by the fact that it controls the gun. Um, you know, this has an impact on China's international image, you know, whether, whether Beijing likes it or not. Uh, and in many parts of the world, uh, China's image has been suffering, at least if you look at the polling data that's out there. Um, to what extent would you attribute that to the nature of the party that we're talking about? Um, and maybe looking ahead, is there anything the party can do to try and improve um, whatever negative uh, aspects are, you know, which attend the very nature of the party itself and how it governs? Thanks, mate. Um, the, I mean, if you look at China's, you know, economic success since the, the economic reforms began in the late 1970s, I think everyone would acknowledge that it's been a tremendous success in terms of lifting people out of poverty um, and, and the general sort of quality of infrastructure that anyone who goes to China you know, can't but be impressed. So clearly the party has done well in terms of you know, achieving economic success and achieving high rates of economic growth and lifting a lot of people out of poverty. When I, when I say lifting people out of poverty, I, I mean that by creating policies which allow Chinese people to lift themselves out of poverty because people were poor in the 1960s and 70s because the government policies had kept them poor. So by, by relaxing those policies, they allowed people to, to actually get better rewards for their hard work. But at the moment, I think the CCP and the People's Republic of China does have a serious image problem. And so, you know, in spite of the great success in, you know, in advancing China's economy and modernizing China's economy, the CCP does have an image problem. And this image problem is bigger in democratic countries than it is in authoritarian or poor you know, parts of the world. So we've seen, for example, in, in, in many parts of Africa, China's image is actually quite positive, even though there have been protests about Chinese projects, et cetera, in Africa. But overall, I think in many developing countries, China has a very positive, positive image. But its image in much of the democratic world at the moment is quite negative. And that is, I think, a big challenge for China. But it, instead of addressing that, instead of you know, doing what Deng Xiaoping was advising uh, you know, the, the people and the party by keeping a low profile and not being too aggressive, I think Xi Jinping has decided that, in fact, we need to take on our critics. We have seen, for example, just this week, uh, a, a you know, senior 
The U.S. State Department official was in Tianjin meeting with uh, Wendy Sherman. She was meeting with the Chinese you know, officials in, in, in Tianjin. And we've seen that the approach that China has adopted is, and not only against the United States, but I think almost any Western country, any democratic country, is that we are not going to cop any criticism. We are who we are. And, and you have to like us uh, the way we are. You know, we, nothing's gonna change. We will continue to operate the way we do, but we are a legitimate force in the world and you have to acknowledge it, you have to respect us and you have to deal with us the way we are. Now, so it sets up, sets up a, what Wendy Sherman this week in Tianjin described as stiff competition between China and the United States and in fact, China and the rest of the democratic world. And I'm not sure how this is going to pan out. I mean, I'm not sure whether this approach by China will continue, whether Xi Jinping will stay in power for the next 15 years uh, or more. Uh, we don't know, but I think that certainly is a major challenge for the rest of the world in dealing with China, because China has adopted an approach that China will continue to be aggressive. China will continue to defend its system and right. its policy. If you don't like it, bad luck. Yeah, you can. Uh, you don't have to like us, but you're going to have to respect us. Uh, that's very interesting. I mean, one thing that uh, I have noticed quite interestingly that under Xi Jinping is a far greater effort underway uh, to promote the party internationally, um, not just simply claiming superiority of the Chinese system as it has worked, lifting millions out of poverty, et cetera, but a much more proactive outreach campaign uh, with other parties around the world. And not only sort of fraternal parties, uh, socialist or communist parties, as was often the case in the past, but a much, much more proactive effort to engage political leaders around the world of various stripes and leanings um, in an effort, I think, to just make the case uh, that the communist party isn't as bad as everybody thinks it is um, and that it has lots of things to be respectful about. Um, you know, whether that's going to succeed, I have my serious questions, uh, but it's clearly the strategy which the party, especially under Xi, intends to promote. Now, we only have a few more minutes here, and I want, I'm going to be very quick here in getting you to respond. Uh, one minute each, perhaps, uh, a little bit on the succession, and answer that question. Are we going to be having this uh, same kind of Zoom conversation in 2049, talking about the Chinese Communist Party? Let's start with you, uh, Eric. Uh, in 2049, that might be a bit of a stretch, but I reckon by 2035, we'll still be talking about Xi Jinping uh, and, the, and the CCP. Um, Joe Biden, you know, it, it, he, Joe Biden, I think, is about heading towards 82 by the time he's um, of the next election. Uh, that's how old Xi Jinping will be in 2035. So we have got a long time to go before we're talking about succession. Um, and, and when it happens, uh, who knows? He's wiped out all immediate threats to his rule. So we don't, we still, I don't think there is a clear candidate yet, and we may not see it for a few years to come. Thanks, Eric. Hey, Ning, how about you? What's your thoughts on this? My observation is CCP is a really resilient party, like really resilient. And even though we might wonder whether there will be a succession crisis when she, like in whatever manner goes down, we have to remember that this kind of succession crisis happened before in China when um, the Chairman Mao and Lin Biao um, event. And CCP actually managed to get through that like very peacefully, but they managed to succeed at it. So I think they will be there in 2049. And I cannot predict anything about succession, but this is a resilient party. Pradeep, I'm going to throw a little curveball at you here. Um, given the current tensions between uh, the business elites, at least some, uh, and the party and the party's efforts to continue in this co-opting uh, uh, process, do you see that having an impact on succession and the ongoing success of the party if, if those tensions continue to, to grow? Bates, one of the successes of Deng Xiaoping was that he created a system in China which was not democratic, which was not moving towards democracy, but it became predictable by the sheer fact that successors to leaders were chosen at least five years in advance. And therefore the party and everybody else knew who would succeed whom. But Xi Jinping by not choosing any successors at the last party Congress 
he has dismantled that system. So there is that, I think, uncertainty about what's going to happen. I mean, the, the, most people predict that Xi Jinping will continue, and I think I would agree with that. I would go along with that. As to your question about you know, the business uh, elite, uh, I think we have a, a situation where China has a large number of very wealthy people. Now, regardless of Xi Jinping's claim in his speech on the 1st of July this year, marking the centenary of the party, that Marxism works, I'm not sure if that's what these business elite actually think or would agree with. And that is going to be a huge question as to where would these people fall if there is another round of turbulence in China. And China has seen turbulence you know, in the past. So there is no guarantee that the kind of calm and stability that prevails in China will continue. Xi Jinping is riding a tiger. I'm not sure he knows how to get off this tiger. Uh, but probably the tiger, you know, the only way to get off is that he, he continues to, to, to stay in office until he dies. So that, that is a big risk because mm. the system has too many people who are dissatisfied with the system. I mean, the, the ordinary masses, if you talk to people in the street, may be, may be happy with their economic you know, status. But at the same time, people who are close to power or who have been marginalized within the power centers, they're not very happy. Certainly a lot of these billionaire businessmen aren't very happy at the moment. Even the millionaires aren't terribly happy with the current policies. Now, remember Bill Clinton when he said that, look, uh, when, he, when he became president, he said, well, we can continue to engage with China if China continues to grow economically, the Chinese people will take care of the rest, you know, basically suggesting that China will become democratic. At least that was the hope. That hasn't happened. But that doesn't mean that this so-called new middle class is completely, you know, apolitical. Uh -huh. I think that these people do have, you know, their own grievances, and they will not be expressing those grievances now. But sometime down the track, if the things do not turn out the way Xi Jinping expects, then these people could have a role in the system. Thanks very much for that, Pradeep. I agree. There are many, many uh, unsolved challenges ahead. Uh, not an enviable position for Xi Jinping or the party leadership itself going forward. Uh, and it remains to be seen. I think we all agree, while we might have a, a, a strong sense of resiliency here, uh, a lot of things could certainly happen between now and um, futures over the horizon. We're going to have to wrap it up here for now. I think it's been a great conversation. Uh, thanks to everyone for the questions that you posed. I've tried to cover as many of them as I could from the Q&A box. Uh, but back to you, James, uh, for a wrap up. And thanks again to our speakers and to all who tuned in. Well, thank you, Bates, and, and thank you to our panel for what's been a, a, a thoroughly fascinating session and a, and a thorough analysis and, and look behind the curtain for how the CCP operates in today's China, uh, particularly from the myriad perspectives from all of our panelists today. Um, as you may have seen at Asia Society Australia last week, we, we released our five year strategic plan of which learning to live with China is one of our four key priorities. There's been a lot of interest in today's session, and if you're looking to understand China's economy more deeply and its relevance to Western business, please keep an eye out for the next instalment in our China Executive Briefing Series with our friends China Policy next month, and explore the link we're sharing with you now for more information on that project. Another, another of our strategic pillars, Generation Asia, hosts its signature event on August the 12th. Marking United Nations International Youth Day, the Generation Asia Young Leaders Forum brings together young leaders for a deep dive into the new realities facing Asia passionate young people. Featuring the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, Jayathma Wikramanayake, be sure to register via the QR code you see on your screen now for this free and public forum. Finally, I'd like to thank all of our Asia Society members and partners for your continued support. Membership and donations help us deliver high quality events and the contributions from members and their varied experiences and knowledge really help us to shape our programming to deliver unique pers perspectives on Asia. I hope you've all learned something today and enjoyed the session as much as I have. Until we see you next time, it's goodbye for today. <laughs>